So good evening, and uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, it's, it's really great to see so many of you here who are interested in hydrofracking and the ways in which you can get involved in this debate. But let's welcome Mark Ruffalo, who's here. Thank you. I'll give you a little bit. OK. Um, I'll just give him a short one. He's an American actor, director, producer, screenwriter. He has starred in films such as Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Zodiac, Shutter Island, Just Like Heaven, You Can Count on Me, and The Kids Are All Right, for which he received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor. He has been a fervent supporter of the film Gasland, directed by Josh Fox, and uh, it explores uh, the dangers of fracking. That's where the uh, lighting of the, the water coming from the sink is uh, featured. But most importantly, Mark has been an outspoken critic of natural gas drilling here in New York. He's been a tireless advocate for environmental issues, and he's used his celebrity to draw attention to this important issue and get countless New Yorkers interested and involved. So, uh, thank, thank you, thank you so much, and um, the stage is yours. Let me just start by saying how I got involved with this issue. About three years ago, I uh, moved my family from um, Los Angeles to upstate New York. I have three small children, and I wanted them to um, experience uh, a little part of the natural world that is quickly disappearing from uh, our lives. And um, part of that was, was open spaces, clean air, clean water, and um, a fairly uh, rural, landscape. Um, around that time I heard about this thing called hydrofracking and uh, this clean burning natural gas, which I thought was a pretty great idea at the time. I think a lot of us probably did. You remember that cute little blue flame that was going to save us from all of our uh, energy woes. And um, I decided uh, once I heard about it to educate myself. And after I waded through some of the uh, the positive talking points from the oil and gas industry, I started to hear some of the horror stories of people, people's wells exploding, um, people being able to light their water on fire, neurological disorders, strange, weird neurological disorders, animals dying, and so on and so forth. So I decided, well, that wasn't even good enough for me. I had to go and look and see where this was actually happening. So I decided that I would go to Dimmick, PA, which has kind of be become the ground zero of hydrofracking in our immediate area. And I went with uh, Robert Kennedy, Jr. And I was taken by Ramsey Adams from Catskill Mountain Keeper, uh, who is John Adams' son. And we went there, and there was about 50 people who had gathered from that community who, when they saw Robert F. Kennedy Jr. walk in, they literally thought that Jesus Christ had had a second coming <laughs> and was literally there to save them. And as we began to hear their stories in this desperation, it became very clear that the, the, the state government and local governments have completely turned their backs on these people. And they were living in, in what you would consider a third world nightmare. They couldn't use the water that was coming out of their taps. You could hear the gas actually percolating, gurgling in their wells that they'd been using for 20, 30 years. Some of these people had those wells in their families for much longer than that. They could light their water on fire. Um, the gas industry refused to take responsibility for it, but said that they, out of the kindness of their heart, would put filtration systems in. These filtration systems took hundreds of square feet. And t this man's entire uh, basement, Craig Sautner's entire basement, was filled with filtration systems and gas separation systems that still didn't clean his water. 
And so finally, the only remedy left for these people was to put a giant plastic water container in their garage, which took half the space of their garage. All of this still with no culpability and no responsibility from the people who brought them this nightmare. Today, about a week ago, we came to find out that the Department of Environmental Protection for, for Pennsylvania has discontinued bringing these people water, that Cabot Oil and Gas does no, longer, no longer has to bring these people fresh drinking water. And so these people are the direct prisoners, the ecological prisoners of this disaster. Their homes are worthless, and now they can't drink the water that comes out of their tap, and now they, they have to fend for themselves and get their own fresh water. From where? Exactly. This gentleman said, from where? Bottled water. Bottled water. <laughs> but, but this is... This is, this is happening in America today. This is happening to our neighbors. This is happening to people in Pennsylvania. And so, I saw this desperation. I saw this need in these people, and I, and, and, and it's, and I saw what they were asking of us. They had nowhere to turn. They, were, they had nowhere left to go. And so they were looking at a two-bit, like, B celebrity, and, and, and a great environmentalist who, frankly, at that point, was pretty much pro-gas from fighting coal his whole life, like many of us have done, and believed that natural gas was the answer, was the bridge fuel to, to this whole renewable idea. And I decided, well, if I am who I say that I am, then I have to actually do something to help these people. And, and, so, and so that's how I came to this place. And believe me, I come kicking and screaming. I think it's great hanging out with you people, but I'd rather be in bed snuggling up with my wife right now when it's 25 <laughs> degrees outside. I'd rather be with my kids in the morning, you know, taking them to school and doing all those things. I have plenty that I would rather be doing, but the fact of the matter is, is this is, this is a big problem. It isn't going to just go away. It isn't going to be legislated away. And the only way, and we're seeing this now throughout the world, the only way that we can institute to change is for us to stand up for ourselves because it isn't going to happen from outside. Um, so, where are we today? We have a natural gas boom that's about to happen in upstate New York. It's happening in Pennsylvania. They're promising a lot of things. Much of it is still yet to be seen. Um, in the end, what is at stake is 15.6 million people's drinking water. It's your drinking water. What's at stake is your quality of air, your air quality. What's often left out of this conversation is that these, there's so, these forms of extraction that we are now in the era of, which I call extreme energy extraction, has changed the way in which we get our energy. There is no longer the easy, we drill a hole in the ground and, and beautiful, concentrated sunlight from millions of years old comes percolating up to the top and we just simply get to use that. Now we've entered an era of extreme energy where our, 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 the way we get our energy is radicalized. It's, and, it, and it costs us so much more to, to create that energy, to bring that energy up. And it costs us so much more in our environment once that energy is here. So the thousands of hours of diesel trucks that are running in upstate New York and Pennsylvania to, 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 to create the amount of pressure that it takes. Imagine this. How much pressure does it take to crack bedrock, to fracture, explode bedrock 5,000 feet below the surface of the earth. That's an enormous amount of energy that has to be created to make that happen. And how you do that is with diesel engines. And those diesel engines have got to run 24-7 for weeks at a time to be able to create that kind of pressure. 
And so that, that diesel, those diesel engines running are putting those fumes into our atmosphere. Last week, the, um, the National uh, Research Center, for that National Atmospheric Research Center came out with a, a, a study that showed, and this is, this is the golden key to this whole argument right now. So many of the environmentalists believe that we need gas in order to move to renewables. That's, that's, been, that's been the common concept that a lot of us have been uh, uh, struggling under. Last week, uh, uh, this research came out that gas is just as bad as coal. But you know what the good news is? The good news is, and I want to thank the oil and gas industry for this, they created the technology because of this beautiful concentrated energy that we've had for a hundred years, we have the technology now to leave this era of, of carbon-based fuel and move into renewables. That's where we're here today. That's what, we're, that's what we're facing. That's our choice. That's our hope. That's, and that's the bright side of all this. The, the bright side, the gift of what we're seeing right now, the gift of, of, of this problem that we're facing, the extreme energy, is that we get a chance to recreate our world with renewables. And we can do it. It's been proven. Uh, Professor Mark Jacobson, who I've been working with from Stanford, says we could be on complete renewables by 20, 30, 2040, and, and we don't have to use gas as a, as a bridge fuel. And that is the good news. And that's what I'm here to talk about and at this point, I'm going to stop talking because I can't hear, take myself anymore. <laughs>